بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا رسول الله وسبحان الله سبحان الله نؤمن به ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستجيره ونستنصره فإنه حق من هذا الله فلا مضل له ومن يضله فلا هادي له ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على الحبيب المصطفى المرسل رحمة للعالمين خاتم الرسل والأنبياء أجمعين وعلى آله الميامين وعلى أصحابه المختارين ونبتهل إلى الله فنقول اللهم اصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا أصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا وأصلح لنا آخرتنا التي فيها معادنا واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر The challenge the challenge in any act of public discourse or public communications is that you must tap within and seek to connect with people at what is presumptive, presumptively shared common grounds what is presumptively something that the speaker shares with the listener. Centered around the idea, in the case of Khutbah al Jum'ah, centered around the idea that the remembrance of Allah in this public devotional act and collective devotional act must be the foundation for the communicative act. The speaker and the congregation, those who are in the listening role The foundation, the very legitimacy, the very rational, the very reason that they get together is to publicly and collectively remember Allah. But what does remembrance of Allah 
represent to people, to the speaker and to the listeners, that who delivers, that who performs the act of speech and the equally critical role of listening to the act of speech and comprehending the speech. Last khutbah, we focused on the idea of izza al izza to lillah. that one sense of dignity, one sense of honor, one sense of elevation must be founded in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to come to Jum'ah. And in my view, the misogynistic interpretation was li which limited Jum'ah to men is clearly unfounded and invalid. No such distinction is made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's command to men and women, as-sa'i li zikrillah, that we come together to remember, to remember Allah, to engage in this public devotional act of zikrillah, You see, this is the other side of the coin to Izza. Zikrillah in a public devotional act, collective devotional act. What does it represent in our real lived experience? I submit to you that Zikrillah communally, collectively, can, can either be an entirely marginal and largely symbolic act empty of all substantive meaning or it can become as core and as fundamentally substantive as the very concept of Izza itself. Relevance and irrelevance is in direct proportion, is in direct proportion to the way that we, in fact, worship Allah, the way we, in fact, recognize Allah in our lives. <clears throat> when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us 
of a very logical and reasonable reality. In Surah Al-Anbiya, when Allah reminds us, not warns us, but reminds us, that if this universe had more than one God, the earth and heavens would have become corrupted, unmanageable, because no God will agree to submit to another God unless forced to do so. And the very act of imposing coercively your will upon the other will lead to substantive resistance, destruction, and collateral damage. If this universe and Earth had more than one God, we would have to maintain a pietistic fiction that the will of these gods are in fact in unison, which is contrary to what we know about the very nature of Izza in an autonomous and supreme being. Allah warns us that the very, if you reflect upon the very logic of the universe, you will realize the obvious. that in order for this universe to function in any orderly fashion whatsoever and not become prey to the will of supreme beings and cease to function because of the clash of wills between these supreme beings, there must be only a single supreme being. But then you come to our world, where our will functions. And Allah has given us an enormous amount of space for our will to function. And to function in a great deal of space autonomously. What happens to human beings when these various wills clash with one another because of the basic element of egoism in the human psyche and the human soul. And the failure of these various human egos, the various human beings situated individually in their own mind as largely supreme and largely autonomous, what happens when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not given Allah's proper role? Let me put it differently. If we come to Juma and what we talk about largely doesn't demand 
anything of us except an indulgent, pietistic, self-serving feeling of wellness. Look, I've put on my taqiyya, I grabbed my prayer rug, grabbed my beads, went, listened to the khutbah, or pretended to listen at least, and then it was done, and I go back home, and I feel good about myself, because we engage in dhikrullah, but in reality, in reality, Allah manifested in this public devotional congregational act only as a, servant, as a servant to the individual ego, the ego of the worshiper. Allah only manifested to tell the, the individual, individual worshiper at Jum'ah, you're fine, you're great, you have taqwa, you have iman, don't worry, inshallah you'll make it to Jannah. And we got together and dispersed and that was it then to what extent was there an actual dhikrullah? To what extent did we really recognize Allah's supremacy and Allah's hakimiyyah? To what extent, in fact, Allah has been present at a public level. Look at it from a different angle. Allah could have said, just worship individually. We act as individuals, we live through family units, and eventually we're done with this life, and that's it. What was it in the public act of dhikrullah that made the mosque and masjid the center of all learning for many centuries in the Islamic civilization. Not just for this, for, not just learning, but the masjid in the Islamic civilization was also the locus, the central point from which the administration of justice extended, from which the jurisprudence of the Awqaf developed, from which even the institutions for collecting and dispenses, dispensing taxes developed, what was it about this act of public dhikr that made the masjid play the vital role in the Islamic civilization that it did play. Consider this from a different angle. We get together this Juma, wherever you are, as you know, unless you're a corpse that you might not have heard about it, 
But throughout Ramadan, Israel has violated the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque. Repeatedly. Israeli extremists, Israeli settlers have insisted on storming the Aqsa Mosque, violating its sanctity. And the Israeli army has repeatedly protected settlers as they assaulted, attacked and assaulted and injured Muslim worshipers. Throughout the course of these events, Israel repeatedly assured the world that they are simply playing peacekeeping police function, a peacekeeping role. And that they have no intention of, in fact, giving legitimacy to the act of Israeli settlers in violating the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque. But then yesterday, right after Ramadan is done, led by a member of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, Yehuda Glick, and like the name suggests, he's another European individual who doesn't see the natives, the indigenous people, as entitled to anything. Led by Yehuda Glick, about 600 settlers stormed the Aqsa Mosque, entering from the Moroccan gate, reaching the Qatanin gate, raising Israeli flags, and the Israeli army announced that, in fact, from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m., from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m., is a time for the Israeli settlers to enter the Aqsa Mosque, violate the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque, and all Muslims must clear out from the vicinity of the area during these times so that Israeli settlers can have the way, their way. And indeed, when the time came, any Palestinian in the vicinity was either assaulted with gas, rubber bullets, beaten or arrested. Al Maqasid Hospital reported injuries from rubber bullets. Two prominent Palestinian activists were severely beaten by the Israeli military. Dozens of Palestinians arrested. And the 600 settlers got to chant death to Arabs and the most vile insults against the Prophet Muhammad and against Islam and not just 
Glick as a Knesset member. But other Knesset members, like Itamar ben Gvir, promised that this is just a step towards the destruction of the Aqsa Mosque and the building of the temple. Around the world, no one thought of protracted, lengthy discourses about the nature of political Judaism and how dangerous political Judaism is. You have dozens of pontificators about political Islam, and the worst of them are Muslim themselves. But I submit to you, if we get together in Juma, if you juxtapose the Israeli settlers who go take the lands of others and center their entire life around their religious dogma, they wake up for their religious dogma. They live for their religious dogma. And they die for their religious dogma. They defy the entire world to take what is not theirs in the name of religious dogma. If you juxtapose those people to Muslims who get together in Jumans all around the world, but because these Muslims, their intellects have been thoroughly colonized their souls have been thoroughly colonized. They imprison their God within the confines of the largely marginal and irrelevant in life. Their God is about the taqiyya they wear, the skull cap, the beads in their hands, the prayer rugs they use, or maybe the hijabs that women wear, their public gatherings, you find God playing no public role. To what extent has their collective act of zikr really involved God at all? When we Muslims, well over a billion in the world, nearing two billion, We know fully well the danger that the Aqsa Mosque is in. We know fully well, regardless of whether we pretend to deny it, the corrupt, the corrupt nature of the family that rules the holy territory of Al Hijaz. We know fully well that the rulers of Mecca and Medina are corrupt to the core. And we know fully well that the Aqsa Mosque is violated day in and day out. 
We know fully well what Israel's designs on the Aqsa Mosque are. We know fully well that the Israeli army protects colonial settlers as they violate the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque. We know fully well no one is interested in talking about the dangers of political Judaism. No one is interested in talking about the risks of political Christianity. The number of Muslims who've actually bought into the concept of political Islam, they themselves adopt the double standards of their colonizer in full face. And then we wonder, why are Muslims where they are in the world? Who has glorified as erroneous as their, as their theological beliefs may be? As, as much as I believe that the Israeli settlers have corrupted their belief in God in other ways, but between these people and us, when the day after the violation of the Aqsa Mosque takes place and Jumas around the Muslim world, the number of Jumas that will talk about what happened in the Aqsa Mosque will not exceed a handful. While these people wake up live and sleep, and wake up and live and sleep. Their political, in quotes, theology. And we are taught to keep our God to the margin of the margins. To keep our God largely irrelevant and stupid. Our God doesn't have anything important or intelligent to say about anything. Their God demands that you change the face of history. Their God demands that you reinvent a history, history that occurred thousands of years ago, a history lost to archaeology, lost to historical narratives, lost to everything. But their God demands what their God demands, and they deliver. We? We are busy making Mufti Mink popular, making Hamza Yusuf popular. We are busy basically using our God to fan the sweat of, uh, of our brows and foreheads. You have no political role God, whatever political means. Because you have no public role, God. Because our colonizers have taught us that your religion is dangerous. Islam, but listen, it is remarkable. It is truly mind boggling. At the same time that we busy ourselves with the sweet feelings of nothing, 
upon nothing. At the same time that our faith amounts to nothing upon nothing. At the same time that we repeat like parrots what our colonizers teach us about the dangers of political Islam and turn Muslims themselves into Islamophobes against themselves. Look, small things, but they tell you everything. Israel, as it escalated its plans against the Aqsa Mosque, and as it looked around and found that Trump moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, nothing happened. Nothing. Countries like Egypt didn't even call their ambassador back. Saudi Arabia the king and the crown prince of Saudi Arabia are enraged and will put their foot down if the American government talks to them about Khashoggi again. Reportedly, MBS started yelling at the American Secretary of State when the American Secretary of State brought up Khashoggi again. But Jerusalem, nothing. Saudi Arabia, the crown prince won't yell. No arms deal would be at risk. No boat deals would be at risk. No luxury deals would be at risk. Israel, the so-called only democracy in the Middle East, right? In the same way, they deal with us as brainless human beings teaching us to parrot uncritically and unthinkingly what they say about political Islam. They also taught us the mantra, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, this democracy has been quietly shutting down all Palestinian civic organizations and civil rights organizations and human rights organizations within Israel. Among the prominent organizations is the organization, the name of the organization is skipping me right now, but Maybe it will come to me. It's something like the Union of Palestinian Women's Committee or something like that. This is an organization organized by Israeli Palestinians, Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship. A civic organization that does everything out in the open. Among the leaders of this organization is a prominent Palestinian Israeli intellectual. Her name is Sahar Francis. Sahar Francis, because Muslims are rarely in the know, has come to the United States several times, last time in 2018, often engages in international forums and conferences and symposia. Well, Israel decided to designate this organization as a terrorist organization. At the time, the United States 
refused to say anything. The United States and the world know fully well that this organization, like so many other Palestinian organizations that were closed down, have nothing to do with terrorism. No one gave protracted speeches about how Israel doesn't understand freedom of speech. No one talked about the dangers of political Judaism. No one pontificated about the relationship between the Torah and lack of freedom of speech. No one. All this type of talk is reserved for Muslims. Now, there was a conference in Mexico about the dangers of Israeli spyware and how Israeli spyware is being used to silence academics and activists around the world. Sahar Francis had a visa to the United States. She was going to land in Florida and after a short stop in Florida, go on to Mexico. Israel refused to leave her, let her leave the country. And they, to boot, the United States canceled her visa. This is just recent. Not under Trump, under Biden. Canceled her visa and announced that her and another colleague is um, he's from the same center, um, Ubay Abud, Ubay, Ubay, Ubay Abud, are both persona non grata not allowed to enter American lands, not allowed to enter American territory. Where are Muslim intellectuals? Nowhere. Where are these verbose arrogant, cocky Muslim graduate students that love to go on about Islamic fundamentalism and political Islam and pretend that they see the world in unique and special ways. Where are they? Nothing. The hypocrisy of our government Denying Palestinians the right to freedom of speech and the hypocrisy of Israel, the quote unquote the only democracy in the Middle East, denying people who are not Jewish freedom of speech. Do you have any? Societies in the United States that give learned lectures about how these people and that people are incapable of understanding of freedom of speech because of their religious convictions, none. When we get together and we speak with one another in a forum like the Juma. And we don't talk about the Aqsa Mosque. We don't talk about the double and triple standards that exist and how Muslims are treated and how Muslims interact with their world. What is the meaning of zikrullah? In what ways is our coming together an act of zikr? Lillah. Is it that we say Allahu Akbar? Is it that we say the Adhan? Is it that because we recite a Quranic ayah? Is it because we can remember a hadith? If Zikrullah doesn't actually represent 
anything that upholds al izza lillah. If Zikrullah doesn't have a causal connection, a nexus, a clear causal connecting point to the concept of al izza lillah, then in what way is it dhikr? Of course, because I have... Muslims are the most oblivious people on the face of this earth. As we speak, there are military trials going on in Guantanamo. After two decades of imprisoning Muslims in Guantanamo, often on the most vague of suspicions and charges, what is emerging out of Guantanamo is that none of the people who were held in Guantanamo can be prosecuted because whatever evidence we, ha we do have against people, it has been tainted by torture. Our government, as these trials are showing, has since 9-11, used unspeakable torture against Muslims, not just in Guantanamo, but all around the world. Give you one example. The trial of a man called a nashri A nashri is a Saudi citizen who was grabbed in Dubai. And after he was grabbed in Dubai, a nashri was held in black sites. in countries including Afghanistan, Thailand, Poland, Romania, Morocco, before being sent to Guantanamo. And nationally, like other Guantanamo detainees, was not just waterboarded. But in fact, his torture including, included keeping him in a crate no bigger than a dock cage for weeks and months at a time. Threatening to rape a Nashiri's mother using a power drill to threaten to drill holes in him, raping him with a garden hose, smashing his head against a wall, hanging him from the ceiling in distorted positions for hours at end, that on top of numerous physical beatings. The description of the torture that is coming out in his trial is incredible. Not just him, but all the Muslim detainees. As a result, it will be a travesty of justice 
to convict him nationally of every, anything. Because everything he said, he said under extreme torture. The Supreme Court has recently ruled to protect two CIA psychologists that were paid $80 million to devise the torture programs that targeted thousands and upon thousands of Muslims around the world. Where is the Muslim voice in this? There are voices that talk about human rights. There are voices that talk about constitutional rights. There are voices that talk about civic rights. There are even voices that talk about just common human decency. What percentage of these voices are Muslim? Next to zero. You can have in churches across the country activists who say, how could we do this? In synagogues across the country, people, theologians, and Jewish scholars that say, this is not right. How many Muslims in Muslim public spaces get together at Jummah and remember that al izza lillah doesn't mean you have a petty and a marginal God who's largely unimportant to anything that transpires in the world. Al Izzalillah means that you have a God who matters through you. So when their act of dhikr doesn't talk about Al Aqsa Mosque, doesn't talk about the hypocrisy of our double standards when it comes to talk to the, the civil rights and human rights of Muslims doesn't talk about what happened to our fellow Muslims all around the world at the hands of our own government. Instead, as a sister wrote to me recently, the biggest and hardest issue in her Islamic center is that women don't want to continue praying in the women designated area because it's extremely hot, poorly ventilated, extremely small, very noisy, and the connection through which they see the khatib on a screen is poor and often cuts out. The do medical doctors and engineers and businessmen who sit at the board of this Islamic center. This is what they come to discuss. This is what they leave after discussing. This is the biggest issue. They are the sisters who don't want to continue praying in the women's area. Aqsa Mosque? Nah. Guantanamo? Nah. God that matters. No, God only cares about keeping women in their prayer area. What an irrelevant and marginal. What a silly God that is. How could Muslims do this to their own Ilah, the only Ilah. How could that be consistent with al Izza Lillah? How could that even be any form of Zikrillah?
Truly, Allah does not change the people until they change themselves. Because Allah has made us the khulafa, i.e. made us the representatives. And like any representative, effectively, Allah has made us the lawyers on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. But Allah told us, if you do a bad job representing me, I will fire you. If your lawyer is doing a miserable job representing you, why keep the lawyer? So I ask you again, when we get together in our Jumas, collectively representing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth, we are God's lawyers. We are God's agents. We are the khulafa. But as attorneys, on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do an embarrassing job. Because we talk about women in their prayer area, keeping women in their prayer area. We talk about whatever we talk about but nothing that matters. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa subhanallah al-Aliya al-Azim, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammad, al-Nabiya al-Mustafa al-Ameen. وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Many people might not realize this But the war in Ukraine has proved to be a marshalling point for many white supremacist movements. Among, there are literally hundreds of white supremacist neo-Nazi movements that have used the war in Ukraine as a marshalling point to establish training camps to marshal resources to develop weapon depots to provide their members with military training, all in the form of fighting against Russia. 17,000 from 50 countries, soldiers, 17,000 from 50 countries have volunteered to fight against Russia in the war of Ukraine, the Ukrainian war. Among these movements is the infamous Azov movement. The Azov movement is a global white supremacist movement that doesn't keep, make, doesn't make a secret of the fact that it is a neo-Nazi white supremacist movement that glorifies Hitler and Nazism, 
the Azov movement using platforms like Facebook has become a focal point for militant white supremacists from around the world, including hundreds of white supremacists from the United States who are signed on by the Azov movement, travel to Europe, get weapons training. The problem, though, the Azov movement is not just about recruiting people to fight in Ukraine. The Azov movement, like so many of the white supremacist movements, with now a global reach, has summer camps for children, has schools, publishing houses, two publishing houses, has its own political party in Ukraine, The Azov movement, after the attack against the Christchurch, the Christchurch attack that took place in New Zealand, where what's his name went around killing Muslims, the Azov movement celebrated the event took the manifesto that was written by the terrorist responsible for the Christchurch attack and distributed thousands of copies around the world of that manifesto and publicly called upon white supremacists to launch more attacks against Muslims all over the West. Despite the fact that since 9-11, white supremacist movements have been responsible for three quarters, four quarters, 75% we got mixed up, three quarters of the terrorist attacks committed on American soil. Movements like the Azov movement is able to recruit fighters, to train fighters, to organize political parties, unhampered. No one is talking about Christian terrorism as no one is talking about Jewish terrorism. No one is talking about the dangers of political Christianity, as no one is talking about the dangers of political Judaism. Anti-terrorism experts are extremely alarmed at the fact that white supremacist movements are able to buy weapons, store weapons, train on weapons, all using the hook of fighting against Russia in the Ukraine conflict with unhampered, unobstructed, even Facebook, which announced that it will limit the activity of movements such as the Azov movements on its platforms, has either proved unwilling or unable. They were very effective in targeting Palestinian activism, very effective in targeting 
anything that they correlate with jihad. This is a clear and rising danger. A danger to Muslims and non-Muslims, but clearly a danger to Muslims in the United States. Let's not forget that these are the same folks who marshaled around Trump and who celebrated the election of Trump. These are the same folks who have turned Islamophobia and the targeting of Muslims into a pastime. These are the same folks who could easily come to power in France, easily come to power in Denmark, easily come to power in Sweden, easily come to power in the Netherlands, Italy, Spain. Now, my final point. Compare us to the Prophet ﷺ. So many Muslims love to pretend to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. Oh, really? The Sunnah of the Prophet was growing a beard, wearing a jalabiya, using a miswak. The Prophet ﷺ was a highly relevant human being. Every time he would get with his disciples, they would be highly relevant human beings. They were highly relevant because their God is highly relevant. They were about making a difference. They didn't get there to work on their Zabibas they didn't get together to feel good about their zik sessions. They made God highly relevant on this earth because they were clear sighted about what al izza lillah means and what. What a zikrullahi akbar means, and remembrance of the Lord is the greatest means. Do you think that the Sunnah of the Prophet was to teach his followers? to be as morally bankrupt as the leaders of Saudi or morally hedonistic as the leaders of the Emirat or morally barbaric as the leaders of Egypt or morally irrelevant as the collective Muslim leaders of today or morally irrelevant as the imams of the 90.9.9% .9 of the mosques of today. How relevant is Allah through you? Allah hired you, appointed you as an attorney on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do you argue in court? What does your client deserve? Does your client deserve acts of pietistic affectations? Or does your client actually want results? 
قولوا قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم اللهم اغفر لي ذنبي اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا يا علي العظيم اللهم اعف عنا وارحمنا اللهم اهدنا لاقرب من هذا رشدا يا رب العالمين اللهم forgive our sins الله guide us to the trace path the true path the sirat al mustaqim الله empower us guide, inspire us to be worthy of you and worthy of your vice presidency and worthy of your agency ya rabbal alamin wa salli wa sallim wa barik ala muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ya rabbal khamsa